Grandmaster's masters of licks and jams. You of savory bars, you of blistered bridges, you bleeding finger busking wizards of the fill, and hark unto me, for one has left this world, rocketing into the altar plane on flames and fire, and honor must be paid, for tribute is demanded whence one offers such righteous tunage, and our tithing must be equal, and what better way to tithe than to remember it? So, Raise your glasses. Not now, like in a minute. I got some shit. <laughs> in glorious tribute of that which was meatloaf. It is a tricky thing, memorializing your heroes. Because, like, they're people, man. And people suck, okay? <laughs> you want to think of them as Greek gods, impossibly strong, larger than the sky capable of making lightning and thunder from nothing and moving the sun, but like also Zeus was a creep, he did some <laughs> fucked up shit to women, he ate his kids, and he probably would have been kicked off a plane for not wearing a mask. So like, <laughs> never meet your gods, I guess. <laughs> like, I did not know Marvin Lee a day, aka Michael Lee a day, aka Meatloaf a day. Why did he call himself Meatloaf? There are many legends. One being that when he was born in Dallas, his father, who was an alcoholic ever since he got back from World War II, suggested that the doctors put meat on his crib because when Meatloaf was born, he was bright red and, quote, looked like nine pounds of ground chuck. <laughs> He'd go on to play defensive tackle for the Thomas Jefferson Rebels, and he got the nickname ML because of his initials, and then that became Meatloaf because he was a big guy, okay? What are you going to do? It works. <laughs> I only knew the entity he became. Because that's what our heroes truly are to us. Entities that activate us and cause us to reflect parts of ourselves that we fucking dig. So when I say we are here to remember Meatloaf, I mean the Meatloaf that birthed Paradise by the Dashboard Lights with Jim Snyder in 1976 in the back of a Honda Civic. Which he did drive at the time and did not, in fact, have enough room to, quote, be barely 17 and barely dressed, body so close, body so tight, going like metal on the edge of a night. Like, it's just not physically ideal, is what I'm saying. <laughs> he moved to L.A. after three months of isolation after his mom died. When he got there, he formed his first band, Meat Loaf Soul, and he opened for Van Morrison and Question Mark and the Mysterions in 1968 at a place called The Cave, where they famously used so much fog during their cover of Howlin' Wolf's Smokestack Lightning that the club had to be cleared out. <laughs> they changed their name to Popcorn Blizzard and the Floating Circus because the 70s were weird, okay? <laughs> that band opened for The Who, The Stooges, MC5, and The Grateful Dead. They had a single called Once Upon a Time, and then Meatloaf joined the L.A. production of Hair, for those keeping score, he has gone from, like, Dallas football Hank Hill to full-on naked long locks singing in hair. It's the American dream, man. <laughs> After that, Motown Records came to him, and he and Sean Stoney Murphy started a duo called Stoney and Meatloaf, which, incidentally, is what I am doing tonight. 1972. <laughs> Meat Love goes back to Broadway with hair, and he meets his future partner in glorious rock and roll crime, Jim Steinman, and they start writing Bad Out of Hell. 1973, he gets cast in the original L.A. Roxy cast of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's like a goth drag clown musical about aliens at a haunted New Year's Eve party. At least that's what I remember. I was pretty tanked. <laughs> Rocky Horror becomes a movie, he comes back as Eddie, he leaves theater to focus on his music, but then National Lampoon's Broadway show Lemmings needs an understudy for his bud John Belushi. So he goes back for that show, and he meets Ellen Foley, who would go on to record that legendary part on Paradise by the Dashboard Lights, where said bodies were about to go, quote, all the way but she has to make sure she's gonna love her forever. You see, yeah. Meat Love mostly did songs about road signs, riding hot motorcycles away from your problems, and fucking in cars. Let's just get that out of the way. <laughs> Jim Steinman and Meat Love shop Bat Out of Hell around, but nobody wants it, 
because it was too wild for civil release in the 70s. <laughs> Have you ever heard anything from the 70s? You can get a Coke bump by smelling the vinyl. <laughs> Finally, Todd Rundgren hears about Bad Out of Hell. He loves it and he produces it in 1977. Side fun fact, music nerds. The motorcycle growl at the end of Bad Out of Hell is not a motorcycle. It's Todd Rundgren on his guitar. There, now you learn something. <laughs> Tim and Meat form Neverland Express to tour Bed Out of Hell, and he gets famous being on Saturday Night Live, breaks his leg, and finishes the tour in a wheelchair. Bad Out of Hell goes on to sell 43 million copies globally, making it one of the best-selling albums of all time. And seriously, if your babysitter never played that for you when you were seven, are you even from the 80s? <laughs> Thirteen years later, many adventures and health problems because he was just too much for one human body to contain. Jim and me create Bat Out of Hell 2, Back Into Hell, which gives us the greatest driving on a highway rock and roll song ever scribed by human beings in the history of Earth, and that which Meatloaf is most known for, for anyone under the age of 50, and his absolute masterpiece, I Will Do Anything for Love. Before you fucking start with me. <laughs> the thing he will not do is the shit he says in the verse before, okay? It's in the fucking song. I don't have time for this shit, and if you have to ask, you already know. After that, it's kind of what it is. He makes songs about bikers and babes going all the way. Bars, beers, and bacon cheeseburgers with album covers that look like the greatest fucking D&D &D campaign ever devised. <laughs> In all of his 12 studio albums, every guitar solo is a gasoline fire, every saxophone doesn't just join in, it screams. Every vocal measure, pure teenage adrenaline, both Broadway drama and heavy rock and roll fused and forged in an iron smelt of hormones and passion, it comes from this drunk leather werewolf soul that once cleared a club with too much fog juice back in 1960 <laughs> That is the meatloaf that gave me life in my hardest times. And that is the meatloaf I want to honor right now because that meatloaf left this earth on a fucking silver black phantom, metal hot, engine hungry, restless and reckless, bleeding Chuck Berry red, on Les Paul, on Humbug, on Strato and Caster, and I heard him exclaim as he rode off into the moonlight, I love you, but you got a hell of a lot to learn about rock and roll. <laughs> but he was also a human. He lived his later life anti-mask mandate, maybe anti-vax, possibly so much that he did die from COVID-19. <laughs> Climate change denying, and he called Greta Thunberg a brainwashed idiot for caring about Earth. So, that must be said as we turn another year into this pandemic. But we're going to raise a glass in honor of the songs. So epic that a meatloaf ballad can be used as a measure of time. A force impossibly strong, larger than the sky, capable of making lightning and thunder from nothing that broke my heart and smelted it back together so many times that it's now basically steel. That's who we're drinking to right now. Because our heroes are gods that activate us and cause us to reflect parts of ourselves that we fucking dig, and they're also humans who kind of suck. <laughs> but two out of three ain't bad. I love you guys.